right, so we're going to go on and uh, continue with the uh, last segment of the uh, technical session today. And everyone's talking. Great. Um, all right. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we have a panel discussion that's going to take about, about an hour. So each one of our uh, panelists here is going to have a 10-minute presentation or so. And then I have uh, three questions that they have been given beforehand that they can talk about. And if we have time, then we'll open up the uh, field for uh, more questions. So uh, on the far left here, we have uh, Fabian Gray. Wait, Fabian. Uh, he's the uh, consultation manager for the uh, Whitefish Lake First Nation, and he's going to talk about the, the work that he does. Uh, we have April Connolly from uh, in the center here. For, uh, she's a senior advisor of Indigenous Initiatives uh, with the uh, Government of Alberta. Um, and we have uh, Heather here, who we've uh, met earlier. So um, I guess we'll start with um, Heather, if you can go ahead and uh, give a talk, and then we'll go to April, and then to Fabian, and we'll go from there. All right, take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm really grateful to be up here again and speak a little bit more. Whenever I speak, I speak from the heart. And when I do these kind of things, I always have an eagle feather. And why we do that is that we're speaking our truth. And a lot of times when people speak their truth, they will get emotional. They will get upset because for Indigenous people, we haven't been treated kindly. The history has shown that. But it also has shown that the ways of doing things haven't worked for our people and that we're in a transitional phase, and that was part of the prophecies for our people, that things will change. But it's gonna be taking that effort for everyone, changing your hearts and minds, a different way of doing things, how we approach things. It's difficult. Change for anybody is difficult. It's not something that's gonna be easy, because when you think about, I always think about the teachings from the elders, and I think about the sweetgrass, those three, parts of the sweetgrass, past, present, future. The past is the old way of doing things, all based on laws made by people that weren't from here, that came from other areas in the world, that didn't have that relationship to the land that we do. We have a spiritual relationship to the land. That's why we get so emotional. That's why we're so invested. This is our home. This is where we live. This is how we live. This is how we exist. So to have people come in and say, well, these are our laws and this is what we're gonna do and this is how we're gonna do it, whether you like it or not, put yourself in our shoes and see how you feel. I myself, I'm not even recognized by my band. I don't even have a home, but yet I still advocate and fight for my people because my late father believed in that. He didn't like all these labels and terms, whether you're status, non-status, Métis, First Nation, all these things, even with the Inuit, it's all labels put on us. As Indigenous people, we have that holistic approach. We're all in this together. When I think about those treaties, the signings, and what, what it says in there, as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, the water flows. Elders also say, when the winds blow. Because the creation story, one of them is, is that the Creator took some earth he put some water and he mixed it up and then he made the image of human, mankind, and he cooked it in the sun. And the only way we got that life was from the Creator when he blew into our mouth to give us life. That's why when we have those understanding of what those words mean, the use of words, language is powerful. The fact that that group had that whole process of explore and trying to find a different way of doing things. I was really impressed with that presentation. I was also disheartened that it didn't go any further. So I do have prayers for those kind of projects to keep moving forward. We can't give up. But in that understanding of those relationships and those words and the power of language, even having a gentleman that was here out here that could speak his language, Cree. And if you can have those opportunities to have translators there, I think that is gonna be even more respectful. This is the year, International Year of Indigenous Languages. So even hearing things like that, it makes me really proud. It makes me happy. I wish I had my languages, I really do. And when I think about the simple terms in Cree or even Sioux, even in some of the French, and my granddaughter, who's only four, 
to hear her uh, say simple little things to me, it warms my heart. When she tells me, Coco, I stumped. And her cute little chubby fingers telling me to hurry up and come be with her. So even those things bring in that pride, that warmth to my heart, because that's who we are. We're connected to the land, and our culture is through language. So even though I don't have my languages, I am so grateful to still have the connections that I have, because it's through those connections I understand who I am. I understand the importance of relationships. I understand the importance of working together. Some people get angry when Indigenous people are involved in different projects, or if they're hired by different levels of government or corporations, even being called an apple. But the reality is we all have a purpose and a place. I am yet one person, but I can tell you that my efforts in advocating and speaking up for my people, I have helped change policies. I have helped change things with Treasury Board. So it can be done. So for those of you that are Indigenous out there fighting this battle, I encourage you because we do have that place and the Creator will bless you if you make that effort. So those are some of the things that I thought of, of what we were talking about today. And again, I thank you for your time. Aye, hi. can try. Give it a try over there. See if it works. Yep. All right. I think this is uh, quite apt. The government person comes with a PowerPoint presentation and everyone else speaks from the heart. <laughs> 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 so uh, as Nathan mentioned, my current role is as a senior advisor on Indigenous initiatives with the government of Alberta and I work in the agriculture and forestry branch, specifically forestry division. Um, when I started with forestry uh, a little over a year ago, this was a new position. And I think that, that um, we've, heard, we've heard a lot about consultation today. And my presentation is gonna focus more on things outside of consultation that government is doing. Um, I think it's important to recognize those small strides. They may not be happening fast enough, but, but there is some progress that's being made. I've only been with the DRA for five years, and I've already seen um, changes that are happening in the mindset and the perspective and the way that we look at how we work with Indigenous people. So the part of the reason that my position was created was uh, to look at different uh, cross-ministry Indigenous initiatives that are happening and to also look at a better way of coordinating um, the concerns that are raised during consultation, um, the things that we're hearing from Indigenous communities across the province and how they relate to forestry and the work that we do and how we can do that work better. So Indigenous peoples have played and continue to play a very significant role in forest and wildfire management. We've heard this from, I think, every presentation that we've heard today. Uh, and, and there's also, um, in, in addition to that evolution, our perception of how government works with Indigenous people and the ways that Indigenous knowledge can be incorporated into forest management is also changing. So my presentation kind of has two main points. I'm going to talk a bit about the different Indigenous initiatives that are involving forestry division and some ideas that I have for working uh, better together. So the first one I want to speak to is the Indigenous Learning Initiative. Uh, this is a training course that's mandatory for all GOA employees um, with the goal of having everybody trained in three years. Uh, this is in response to the TRC call to action that Peggy spoke to earlier this morning, um, number 57, which asks that uh, all government employees um, where all public servants be educated on the history of Aboriginal peoples, including the history and legacy of residential schools, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, treaties and Aboriginal rights, Indigenous law, and Aboriginal crown relations. So each of these sessions is held jointly with an elder and a GOA employee. Uh, there's only about 30 people in attendance. They start in circle and they end in circle. Um, and I think all of that helps to really facilitate some discussions and the session that I went to, we had some very frank and open conversations about the challenges that we're facing as government employees and uh, ways to approach that better. Uh, there's also an Indigenous learning panel which uh, was created with representation from Indigenous communities across Alberta and it kind of feeds into providing ongoing advice into uh, learning opportunities. So 
So I, along with about half of forestry division now, have taken this training. Uh, the training is only a day. I think it provides a very good baseline information, and I think it's particularly useful for people that aren't working with Indigenous communities on a day-to-day -day basis, because those that are probably already have a lot of the information that's provided. Um, but what I think is most valuable is that it provides the people with the time and the space to reflect on what they learned and how it applies to their lives and their work. Another thing that we're doing a bit differently is S10. So for those of you who don't know, S10 is a forest management unit in the Slave Lake area. It currently has two conifer operators, but the deciduous timber is not yet allocated. It was originally requested that the, the deciduous timber be, uh, or a deciduous timber quota, be uh, direct allocated, but we decided to take a different approach in this case. And we put out a request for proposal. And what makes this different is that 40% of the evaluation criteria is weighted towards uh, how the proposals are incorporating Indigenous partnerships. So it's more related to the goals of communities of the Bukhan Lake Band and Blue River First Nation. Um, and then, like, less influential the further away from the area that you go. So this is, uh, I think, the, the deadline for this proposal just happened last week. So it's definitely still a work in progress, and I'm sure we'll learn a lot um, through this pilot project. And the Junior Forest Ranger Program, I'm sure everybody here is aware of this program. <laughs> it was established in 1965 to train and educate youth in forestry. It was always open to Indigenous youth if they wanted to apply. But in 2003, we started more directly recruiting Indigenous youth. And the crews that, uh, that contain Indigenous youth usually have a community representative that is on them as well. And one of the goals of this program is to have 50% Indigenous crew membership. And it also incorporates um, an Indigenous Culture Day and a Bull of the Woods competition in the final week. I think the program is six weeks of human resource. Um, so it gives the youth a chance to share their culture with the other youth that are participating and uh, to share what they've learned about forestry. So there's been about 600 Indigenous youth in Alberta that have participated in this program, and I think they've been from about 25 different communities. And the last program or project I think is a very interesting one, and it speaks to uh, Indigenous practices with fire and using fire as a management tool. Uh, so the Indigenous Climate Change Observation Network is an environment and parks led program. Um, it's a forum for Indigenous knowledge holders and scientists to work together and produce the best available knowledge to support Indigenous communities' resilience to a changing environment. Uh, the, one of the objectives is, uh, of this Fire with Fire project was to look specifically at um, mobilizing Indigenous and scientific knowledge on fire to inform innovative practices for adaptation and reducing the risks of wildfire management. And one of the outcomes, uh, which I find very interesting, was the participatory videos. So they, uh, one of the concerns was they were losing, um, was intergenerational knowledge transfer. So they were using participatory videos to document knowledge from, from their communities specific to wildfire management, but now they also have the skills um, to apply that to other forms of, of uh, gathering their knowledge. So I want to speak a little bit about um, some ways that I think we can work better together within our current system. Um, and I think a lot of these have already been spoken to today. So forestry has a unique, uh, is a unique industry in that you're working in the same region year after year. This gives you a great opportunity to build those relationships with Indigenous communities, and it also makes the investment that you put into building those relationships more worthwhile, both for community members and for industry or government employees or whomever is working in the area. Uh, another way I think we can work better together is um, by finding common ground. As Heather mentioned, um, natural resources are very tied to culture, land is very tied to culture, and I think foresters feel that as well. I think there is a forestry culture that feels very connected to the land, and that's, I think, a lot of why people go into that industry. Um, one thing that I think is really interesting about it is that 
that both indigenous peoples and foresters in this province have historically viewed themselves as stewards of the lands, and I would say can still, still view themselves that way. So that, in a sense, is, is I think, part of why we butt heads. We're each asking each other to trust that we can work together. Uh, but um, we're also, but that trust like, isn't necessarily always there. Um, but I do think that it is a point of common ground that that end goal of having forests that are managed for the public good is the same. Um, and then I wanted to add the point of making your information meaningful. So a lot of the time I see information packages that are sent to communities that are quite large and they use technical language. All the information is there, but it's not necessarily accessible. And I think this is kind of tied into that building of relationships. If you know your communities that you're working with, some of them may have great forestry capacity and they might want all that technical information. Others might not and they might need um, it translated into something that is more meaningful into, well, you're going to do this. How does it impact water? How does it impact moose populations? How does it impact the health of my community? Um, so, so knowing your audience and making that information meaningful to them, I think, is a, a form of capacity building. And the last thing I want to say is give yourself time. Don't rush the conversation. Leave time to explore. And uh, I think having the time and space to have those difficult conversations and having them not just when consultation is happening, but all the time, um, it, I think it, it, it goes a long way to demonstrating respect. Uh, that you're willing to listen and that you're going to consider their concerns. That is all. All right, Fabian, let me get your uh, presentation up. How long has this what I'm working on right now? Just the background, I'll just talk. Can you test to see if the uh, if it'll work from all the way, Fabian. Oh, what happened? Security alert. Uh, <laughs> okay, see if it works. Okay, it works, great. All right, the stage is yours, Fabian. Hi, my name is Fabian, as you all know now. Um, every time I introduce myself to government or industry, I always get, oh, you're Fabian. <laughs> Now you know. Uh, I work for a consultation office on farm for my nation. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I, it's not my land. I didn't create it. You didn't create it. The one who has the right to dispose of it is the one that has created it. All we can do is share it, um, keep it, and for our, for our future generations, because we're all the same. Oh. Anyway, this is uh, one of the, how I wanted to bring in uh, Western science into, the, into a traditional, some traditional knowledge into, into it. Is I started a wildlife monitoring program. I have about uh, 100 cameras out there. And, uh, uh, the objectives were provide data measurement and, and conversation, conservation of traditional lands and the species with like deer, moose, elk, and everything like this. And how in these industrial developments are affecting the species inhabiting our traditional lands. So I'm basically bringing in GIS to measure all this. Stuff. I, I have an extensive background in forestry. I planted trees, I laid out cut blocks. I have my forestry, forestry uh, certificate, and I worked in oil and many aspects of uh, industry, oil and gas, and all that. So I know what change, what changes come in our lands, and even with forestry. Uh, I understand that forestry, uh, the trees are to use the analogy as, uh, what do you call it, um, as 
fruit or vegetables in your fridge, they're disposable. So if we don't use it, they're rotten. Right? So all, all I think is that we need to do is have better management practices within within uh, the land because it's it's not working right now. I don't think. With even if the spraying and everything else of of uh, these cut blocks that I've been into, I'm I'm okay every, almost every day, and, and some of these uh, traditional plants that we use aren't going to come back into that cut block due to the spray. So I started another pilot project with a company called Greenlink to map out our traditional plants. So I ensure if you're gonna cut down this cut block over here, that these plants are right here. It's a pilot project that we started, Matt and I, hoping to put in a bigger scale. So I'm trying to bring in GIS, forestry perspective, and our traditional land use our plants in, together in, in this sense, in the planning, in the planning stage before the consultation stage. So we, we maybe we'll share this information with other companies so they'll have it in the planning stage instead of the consultation stage. So makes so we're a part of the process so within the uh, uh, what do we call it? eligibility maps that are made. So the the the, the, uh, the lesions of certain areas are on. We just want to be a part of the process in the beginning, not in the consultation beginning, but in the planning process. So I think that's one of the areas that we, we can work on even. I don't think the others are going to like what I'm, do, I'm going to do with the traditional plant, but I'm hoping to ensure that there is, there is plants that for them to use. I hope they see that. <coughs> so I'm kind of like a pariah tomorrow. I'm going to be like a pariah to my, my own uh, trying to ensure there is plants and like uh, even moose for us to hunt and all that stuff. And I, I applied for funding with the federal government. Um, it's always a, a, a challenge for capacity. I got 450000 from the federal government for this three-year program. And if you want to get in good with the First Nations, partner with them or something like this. Partner with them. Government doesn't know everything. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if we created a partnership between First Nations and forestry companies where, where, where you guys are, an actual partnership that, that will work, the government will try and break it up because it's working. Right? <laughs> They'll create some kind of policy and that to throw it out, okay, pull them apart. But if, if we're part of the process and you guys are working with First Nations in your areas, then it, it is going to work. There's no, there's no two ways about it, right? Model of my wildlife modern program. Um, I have three, years, three government agencies wanting my data after I'm done. I want to, um, West Fraser wants my data when I'm done. And I even asked them to partner with me. They wanted to pick it back on my, on my program. And then they've been giving me the end run for the past, the past three years. Now it's what I have one more year left. So it's stuff like this that you can implement on um, with first nations at a bare minimum of cost. Maybe the the drum will loosen up a bit. You know? It doesn't that's that's all that's all we need is some particip participation in the planning stages, consultation stages. Data share agreements. When I do assessments for cut blocks, I share my uh, my 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 uh, my assessments with uh, the company that that's paying me on Provo or West Fraser. I share my information, my traditional land use information with them. 
it's stuff like that. Well, we, we, even First Nations have to come halfway to meet the, for the better good, for the greater good, for both, for both of us, all of us. So I think we have a lot to do, but people like me and well, actually, there's, no, there's nobody like people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping that we could come together for something like this in that, in, in uh, different uh, areas, Loon Lake, Woodland, and everywhere. Make them feel a part of it. It doesn't cost very much. Uh, it costs me 75000 a year for six, to put six people to work every six months and that's it. just to change the SD cards and the batteries and that, that's, that, that's that's not even your your uh, your bonus right so you 10 10 15 percent bonus every time <laughs> and that's, i partnered with you know tech it's a non-for-profit government this is government agency down on the south side of Edmonton. That's my traditional army sir. <laughs> That's my crew. Um, I recently passed away here about two weeks ago. I'm in the blue. And those are the cameras that we use. I have a hundred of them all over. We GPS them, we geotag every picture, and you know that crunches the data, puts it on the map. And I, ABMI wants that there, and some other companies want that there. Um, I yeah, this was last year's, with one year early cancer As we are, as First Nations are getting into GIS more, you'll, we'll get along more. Because forestry, uh, forestry sex, and they used to say, if they don't ask, don't tell them. So when I started asking questions, starting to be, I think it was Todd Bailey nervous. If you guys know Todd Bailey, he's a for, he used to be a forester for uh, West Fraser. Now he's working for a first nation. So. But uh, with capacity, uh, have, um, that's where we need help. Start programs like these for First Nations. Like this is just the ABMI slides. This is what we're hoping to do in our traditional land use area. This just a focused area. Like if you ex explain certain things to First Nations in a, such a way that they understand, they'll they'll work with you. They're not they're not uh, unreasonable. Sometimes I. And some of the cameras here, there's some pictures here. Um, the people didn't even notice that they were there. There's the bulls. There's a caribou up north. That one's dead now. <laughs> and there's that couple of bulls fighting here. Cameras there. So, that's, so this, this is just an example of what I've got. Some data that we're going to have to trust. But with that, I think with programs like this in the traditional plant study uh, mapping, I think we could uh, move ahead together. Hopefully. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, all right, so we have uh, three questions that you guys have had in advance, and uh, we have uh, about 10 minutes for each question amongst the three of you, so be sure to share the microphone. So, question number one. What about indigenous culture and history should Western society be aware of? Who wants to start? There's a, a lot of things about history that we can learn about 
but in terms of that relationship of indigenous, non-indigenous, understanding the true history of Canada is the first step. Understanding the impact of colonialism, that they affected the diet, they affected the dance, the dialect, and our deity. I remember at one of the sessions with uh, elders on the TRC and having all of that time of trying to work through this and what the elder had said was that, you know, they can take everything they want away from us, and they have. But the one thing they can take away and never have was our spirituality. So understanding the work we do is from the spirit. A lot of people don't understand that. So when I was talking about the sweetgrass, the past, old ways of doing things, the present, we're only in that place of awareness now, being awake, the future, having that ability to think beyond ourselves, the future, for all of us to benefit together, working together, helping each other in a good way. Understanding that we have to do this together with that kindness, compassion, understanding, and patience. Well, as a member of Western society and a pale Irish girl from Vancouver, I don't know that I can <laughs> authentically speak to this directly, but I'll, I'll mention a few things that I think have helped me. Um, I think being humble, and recognizing that you you may know a lot relative to other Canadians, but you probably don't know all that much. Uh, be humble in your knowledge and be curious. Um, I think that goes a long way. Um, and I also want to say something that I don't think has come up today is recognizing that Indigenous culture is complex and there's no one culture in my experience. Like Every community is different. Uh, and just because something worked with one community doesn't mean it will work with the next one that you work with. So again, asking questions. Um, society, be aware of that. We were here first. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, question number two. <clears throat> uh, what, rec what recommendations for best practices and etiquette do you suggest to account for uh, cultural dis differences? it's not one model fits all that you have to get to know the people just like in your family you can have the same home same parents same everything and have five kids if you're lucky and each child could still have their own personality so as parents you have to learn how to work with each one differently so in terms of how we are as human beings just realizing that again that, that understanding that we have different ways of doing things even in communities, the impact of residential schools, there are actually communities out there that are divided. That there's some that follow the real Christian way and go to church, and there's some that are traditionalists. So understanding there's even complexities within the communities. Understanding that when you go to a community, you might have an understanding or be taught that how you approach an elder is to offer tobacco. Some of the elders might get offended and not want that. So it's just gonna take that time and effort that you invest in that relationship and getting to know the people, understanding that their own protocols will be different from place to place. And that's that step of getting out of your comfort zone, getting out of that way of how you're so used to doing things. You think about how many hundreds of years my people have been uncomfortable, apply it to yourself for those few minutes of starting that first step of building that relationship.
I think I'm going to build on that a little bit as well. Um, I have been in that position where I've felt uncomfortable and I've, I've been worried to uh, say the wrong thing or offend somebody. And in my experience, as Fabian was saying, in, indigenous people are reasonable people. <laughs> they, like, they're excited to share their culture with you. They, if, if you come to them and you're interested and you're curious and you're open to learn, like, they will be open to teach you. Uh, they might tease you, but I think that's a good thing. That just means that you're welcome. <laughs> Um, I don't really think there is any cultural differences. There's just, to me there isn't, but this fall, I went to the, um, change some SD cards in my cameras by seeing non, non 3D hunters. They, they took their kids, they brought their kids in their lives. They, they, they had to had six boys, they have to fill the freezer for me. Same, same thing I do. So I don't really think there's any cultural differences. It's just the, the stigma of being labeled three. Yeah. All right, uh, final question before we uh, open it up to the audience here. Um, what is one suggestion you have to enhance policy regarding indigenous consultation? When I think about the whole system has to be overhauled and that understanding that indigenous people need to be part of the process from the beginning. I shared an example earlier today where as I as an indigenous person, a spiritual community recognized leader that I have been asked to help give guidance on projects and different things and and yet they've come approach me and that protocol you know giving me tobacco and I pray on it so it's a spiritual effort and then that group or person just does whatever they want anyway but yet they can go and try and say well I went approach an elder and I got a blessing and I you know so those times it does hurt me but then I think the Creator knows, the Creator knows my effort, my intention, just as He knows what this person, our group has done. So understanding that everything we do has consequences. So when we look at what we're trying to do and changing things, we have to be more inclusive to all of the people that are going to be part of it, who, who it impacts. No longer is it going to be an afterthought of, oh, we, we better consult or talk to the Indigenous people. Because it doesn't work. It hasn't worked. It's not going to work. So change needs to be done. It took hundreds of years to get where we're at today, and it's going to take time for it to us to adjust. So my biggest thing is having indigenous ways of doing and knowledge and, and how we exist to be included in these processes. It's amazing how things are changing. Like even the court systems, being able to go, instead of swearing on a Bible, being able to hold a eagle feather. That truth, that honesty, that commitment, the intention, understanding how much that means to be connected to the Creator when you hold that feather and you go to court. Those types of things where it is an overhaul. Things are adjusting. Things are going to change. It's going to take time. But including us from the beginning is my biggest thing in respecting what we have to say and in planting implementing our suggestions is going to be a huge thing. Policy is always a hard one for the government person to answer. But when I look at the different uh, Indigenous initiatives that have been happening at the GOA in the last few years, um, the ones that I see that have created the most positive change are the ones that have involved Indigenous people, as Heather was saying. And I think um, aligned with that, is also the need to bring everybody with us. So, so we can make changes, we can implement whatever policy we want, but if, if everybody is not on board and everybody is not moving together in one direction, it's gonna be a lot harder for any of that policy to actually have teeth and to actually be implemented and to stick around long term. 
Um, there's an African pro proverb that one of our wildfire guys always says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that these processes take time. They take conversations and they take um, working together in like an authentic manner. Um, and it may not be the fastest way to make change, but I really think it is the way that changes stick. I've never, I didn't know there was any positive changes in any policies. I've, worked, I've been in consultation for six years now. And I haven't seen any positive changes. Um, my suggestion is to, to, enhance, to enhance that is use common sense. No. Don't overanalyze, don't overreact, don't over, don't over anything. Let's use common sense. That's simple. All right, excellent. So we do have time for questions. Uh, feel free to come up to the microphones. Uh, don't be shy. some of your experiences there um, and also some of the maybe what you see as some of the challenges and perhaps also some of the opportunities going forward. Is that that SWAT thing? <laughs> Strengths, weaknesses, and what are the other ones? <laughs> yeah. I just swat them away. No. Um, <laughs> I, I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the things I was going to talk about was in terms of making those changes. So what I've seen in my years of work is that there are a lot of um, efforts being made to have more uh, Indigenous awareness training, making it mandatory for a lot of departments, the city, the province. I've done a lot of work with schools, there's uh, universities, colleges, they're now making it mandatory for students to have an uh, Indigenous Awareness Training course before they can get their degree. So a lot of work is being done. So even with the departments, um, my experience with Natural Resources Canada at the Northern Forestry Centre has been very beautiful. I've been very welcomed, I've been very respected, I've been honoured. Um, even this example of this conference today, when I was first approached and asked to help. And the reality of with each step they were taking, they would still include me and honor me and take my guidance and my suggestions. To me, that's a really good thing because I talked about supporting our artisans. They don't get often asked to be part of a lot of things. That support on the federal side of things, we're, we're commit the commitment we made was to have 5% support to Indigenous economic development in terms of giving them those opportunities. The government as a whole is at 0.06%. So these kind of little steps, these little bit of efforts can help. Having a connection to those service providers that provide Indigenous awareness training, those types of things. Not relying on one Indigenous employee in your company, your department, to be the knower of all. They get burnt out. The expectation that they're going to be the savior for our people is tiring. Inviting and having people on staff that can help with those different things does make a difference. So the work I've done to help the Indigenous employees that are there, there's only a few. My intention and my work and everything I've been doing already, I've already seen some really good results. They've been asked me to help with doing a whole reconcil reconciliation strategy overhauling the whole department, how they hire, how they indigenize a space, having artwork. When I go anywhere and if I see indigenous artwork, it, it instantly puts me in a place of calmness. I already feel like I'm, I'm more welcomed. I'm actually acknowledged I exist. My people didn't get all killed off. That we're here, we're resilient, and we have a lot to offer. So in my work there, it's been really beautiful. I do a lot of the uh, work in terms of providing guidance one-on-one. -on -one. 
And we're taught to be humble, and a lot of times when I'm in these situations, I, I don't feel like I really know anything. I don't really have much to offer. But again, when I do my work, I rely on the Creator, and that's where it comes from, because it is to help all of you. So thank you for asking that question. And in terms of how you can apply that, is just think about different ways of how you can infuse Indigenous people on, at all levels within your, within your organizations. Not just the low levels, but at all levels. Any other questions? Uh, good talks, everyone. It's awesome. I got to talk to you later. <laughs> uh, overlapping interests, overlapping uh, traditional areas. Yeah, yeah. So, if you uh, have a situation where you have a First Nation or a, a Métis settlement and they have a particular area and you know that's, that's the area you want to work with them, it works pretty good. But then there's 11 other communities stacked on top of it. And they all have interests as well. Uh, what's the best way to work in a situation where you have and I'm talking anywhere from 10 to 20 overlapping traditional areas. Um, Fabian? <laughs> uh, I, I, I stick to my own areas. I, we, there is an overlapping surrounding communities, but what, what we do is uh, we have an agreement if we don't have the capacity to do it, they will they will do it. Either it's if it's um, environmentally wise or financially wise, we we talk to each other and see if they're capable to go ahead and do it. We'll do the next one. We have an agreement like that. But we just use trying to use common sense and. Uh, I could expand my traditional land use area, but I don't. Because, um, just because I have a wife from Alaska doesn't mean my Tuolumne has to my traditional area now. So uh, I don't claim land that isn't mine. So other nations do it's their progress, but I take care of my own. And I use common sense and judgment. If we can do it, we're first nations. We, we work together. Basically. Do you want me to answer too? Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, the government answer is that's a business decision that your company would have to make. Um, my personal perspective is that bringing everybody together and having those conversations. Communities are perfectly aware that their traditional territory or the consultation areas of interest are overlapping. Um, so that they'll, they'll know that that conflict exists and, and having that conversation collectively means that you can move forward in a way that is more likely to be beneficial to everyone. I'm not uh, personally uh, aware of how everything works out there, but I think of different organizations that exist already to see how they work through things. And, and the reality of the situation today is more uh, case uh, resulting uh, findings or uh, decisions that have impacted, so like the Métis harvesting uh, rights. So that's, that's changing a lot of the landscape out there too. The other one that I'm aware of, again, I don't know much details about them, but even controversy within that, the Treaty 8 uh, Trappers Association. And so these are organizations that exist, so my suggestion would be to reach out to them and see how they're doing things, and, and part of that could be, again, relationship building, because they might be able to give you guidance and some direction on, on how to move forward on some of these things. Great. Any other questions?
Okay, I uh, guess that's the end of our uh, panel discussion. Uh, thank you all. And uh, that concludes the day.